Hello and welcome back to The Pisky Trap, a series where we explore the folklore, history and legends from across Devon and Cornwall. It's been a few weeks, but we're back again to explore a range of new stories ranging from local folklore and legends to forgotten aspects of local history and the various different themes along the way. At the outset, I just want to say a massive thank you to everyone who's been listening so far for all of your lovely messages and feedback and a huge thank you to all the lovely people who've signed up to my Patreon. I really appreciate that because it really does help me to keep this project going. While the Pisky Trap is completely free, if you'd like to lend your support to the project and enable me to cover the running costs and continue researching, then you can find me at patreon.com forward slash the Pisky Trap. And if you've been enjoying the series, then please give us a like and subscribe and recommend it to your friends. Just before we get started, it's become sort of a tradition that I give a little plug to a Southwest artist, creative or fellow podcaster. Well, recently I've been reading a great book called Black Dog Folklore, written by the brilliant Mark Norman, author and host of the Folklore Podcast, which I highly recommend if you're interested in all things folklore from all around the world. And you can find that at thefolklorepodcast.com. So I recommend you give that a listen. And Mark's book is fascinating if you're interested in the stories and the folklore surrounding black dogs and spectral hounds. From tales of Black Shuck or the Bar Guest to the Hound of the Baskervilles and lots of other localised stories too. I really enjoyed this book because it delves into a range of different types of black dogs, the tales associated with them, a range of eyewitness accounts and sightings over the years, and also explores a lot of the different themes as well. So if black dog folklore is your thing, I recommend grabbing yourself a copy. Right then, let's crack on with the episode. For those of you who've been following the series so far, you may have heard me mention on a couple of occasions little aspects of local stories or legends that we've explored, and I've said something along the lines of that's a separate thing that warrants its own episode, or it's worth delving into a bit deeper on another occasion. And so this episode is going to be a closer look at one of those themes. It first cropped up in the very first episode, in fact, when we were looking at the stories and the history surrounding Pengersic Castle down at Prey Sands in Cornwall. It also featured a couple of episodes back when we were looking into the phenomenon of ghost layers in the 17th and 18th centuries. And as I've continued to research, time and again this particular theme keeps cropping up everywhere. So I decided it was high time we took a closer look. And I'm referring here to stories involving the white hair. There are so many legends and local stories, particularly in Cornwall, in which a white hair appears, either as a ghostly form, as some kind of omen, or involved in some kind of transformation, quite often caught up with magic, sorcery and witchcraft. So we're going to be taking a look at some of the stories and legends from across Cornwall that feature the white hair in different ways. Trying to understand why this creature in particular is so significant, the various meanings and interpretations that seem to go along with it, and the many superstitions that seem to have existed for a long time surrounding the hair. Helping me to try and demystify the white hair and explore this a bit further is the fantastic author, storyteller and musician Mike O'Connor, who you may remember from our chat about Cornish mermaids a little while back. And we'll be chatting all things hair related when it comes to folklore. This is going to see us looking at a mixture of local ghost stories, local legends, some of which are almost fairy tale-like in quality, traditional customs and superstitions, and elements of witchcraft thrown in the mix as well. 
So, without further waffle from me, here's our next episode, The White Hair. In Christian countries, the hair, like many other symbols of the old religion, was thought of as an evil spirit. It always portended bad luck, but originally it could be a good or bad omen according to the way it moved. It was one of the creatures used for divination. In some parts of England to this day, it is lucky to meet a hare, and a wish should be made as soon as it has passed. In others, it is only the white hair which is unlucky. To see a black one is a sign of good fortune. But to see a white hair near a Cornish seaport meant that a storm was coming. That was a quote from a book called The Leaping Hair by George Ewart Evans and David Thompson. And I think just within that, we get a sense of some of the superstitions that are attributed to this particular animal. So, to begin with, I suppose we should talk a little bit about the hare as an animal and how it has been linked with legends and folklore over the centuries, because it seems that mythology and stories surrounding the hare seem to have been around for a very long time. For whatever reason, we're fascinated by this creature. Many people have speculated that it's to do with its particular behaviour, Maybe because it's quite elusive, maybe because it's nocturnal as well. And they just don't seem to be as well understood as rabbits, for example. Then we have phrases like, mad as a March hare. Then we have the fact that they box each other. They've also been included in lots of different stories over the centuries, millennia even. Off the top of my head, I can think of... Aesop's Fables, for instance, and then much more recently, Lewis Carroll, with the whole Mad Hatter's Tea Party thing. When it comes to mythology and the hare, we can go way back in time. There seem to be representations of a hare-headed deity in ancient Egypt, who was said to have been a goddess of fertility, renewal and protection, Ewart Evans and Thompson write, the hare was built into early Chinese mythology. In China, they refer not to the man in the moon, but the hare in the moon. And the hare was a resurrection symbol. So, renewal or resurrection seems to be a bit of a recurring theme. They go on to say that hares appear in Indian legends too, as well as in ancient Greece and Rome, Native American cultures too had the great hair of the Algonquins. So the hair appears all over, basically. But for our purposes, obviously we're going to be focusing on the legends and superstitions in Britain and Cornwall in particular. I've mentioned a number of times in the past my passion for local ghost stories and the part that they play in local folklore, history and superstition, and the white hair comes up all the time. Lots of stories come down to us from the likes of William Bottrell, Robert Hunt, Margaret Ann Courtney, all people that we've talked about before. And the hair seems to crop up in very specific ways, or at least in a very particular context. It's a definite recurring theme. And that's, I think, one of the major things that drew me to want to look into this a bit further, because there is almost a set pattern to these stories. So, jumping straight into it, I'll give you an example. In Cornish Feasts and Folklore, Margaret Ann Courtney includes this particular theme, 
And it's actually while she's pondering whether there might be a link between a story from the Gulville and Castle and Dinas area and another legend from further west. She writes, and I quote, Not far from Burian is a very solitary weird spot, a disused Quaker's burial ground. In its lonely neighbourhood is sometimes seen by a privileged few high by day the spirit of a huntsman, followed by his dogs. He is dressed in the hunting costume of bygone ages. He suddenly appears, for neither his horse's hooves nor his dog's feet make any sound, jumps over an adjacent hedge, and is as suddenly lost to view. I do not know if tradition has ever connected this huntsman with Wild Harris of Kenegi, who was killed when hunting by a fall from his horse. It was frightened by a white hare, the spirit of a deserted maiden, which crossed its path. End quote. So, those of you who listened to the Ghost Layers episode may recall our old friend Wild Harris of Kenegi, but it's this encounter with the white hare that I want to pay particular attention to. Time and again, we come across stories where a gentleman who's often portrayed as a bit unpleasant or often immoral is out riding and their horse is startled by a white hare crossing their path, which results in injury or misfortune or death. It's something that Mike O'Connor included in his book in the retelling of the legend of Pengersik, and I quote, The next day, Pengersik was out hunting. He was up on Tregoning Hill when a great storm engulfed him. In the midst of the storm, he saw a white hare with eyes like fiery coals. In his heart, Pengersik knew it was the spirit of his dead mistress. The hare so startled his horse that it reared up. Pengersik was thrown to the ground and knocked senseless. Next day, he was found on the hill in a terrible state. So, so far, pretty similar to this Wild Harris legend. Except in this instance, Pengersik survives the encounter, though obviously injured, and the story continues. From that day, Pengersik was terrified. He would not go out unless he had a priest beside him. But even so, whenever he ventured out, the white hair would appear and leave him quaking with fear. The priest tried to exorcise this ghost, but found he had no power over it. Then she appeared in her human form, explaining that she was no evil spirit, but a cruelly wronged woman and she would not cease until her son received his rightful inheritance. End quote. So here we have not only the appearance of the white hare in ghostly form crossing Pengersik's path and startling his horse, but then he's haunted by this apparition. And on top of that, we have not only the hare spirit, but this idea of transformation into the form of this woman who's clearly been wronged. So there's quite a lot to unpack here. There seems to be a strong link and an association in these stories with the sudden appearance of the white hair and it being considered a ghostly apparition, usually the spirit of a woman. At this point, I want to come back to Robert Hunt, who talks about this in his popular romances of the West of England. He says, and I quote, It is a very popular fancy that when a maiden, who has loved not wisely but too well, dies forsaken and broken-hearted, that she comes back to haunt her deceiver in the shape of a white hair. This phantom follows the false one everywhere, mostly invisible to all but him. It sometimes saves him from danger, but invariably, the white hair causes the death of the betrayer in the end. end quote. So it's interesting that he picks up on this theme that it tends to be a young woman who has been wronged in some way during her lifetime and then returns as a spirit to haunt that wrongdoer. He 
He then goes on to relay a story in, I have to say, a very Victorian way. I should point that out. It's very of its time. That seems to be an amalgamation of tales that have been told to him over the years. And I quote, A large landed proprietor engaged a fine, handsome young fellow to manage his farm, which was a very extensive as well as a high-class one. When the young farmer was duly settled in his new farmhouse, there came to live with him, to take the management of the dairy, a peasant's daughter. She was very handsome and of a singularly fine figure, but entirely without education. The farmer became desperately in love with this young creature, and eventually their love passed all the bounds of discretion. It became the policy of the young farmer's family to put down this unfortunate passion by substituting a more legitimate and endearing object. After a long trial, they thought they were successful, and the young farmer was married. Many months had not passed away when the discharged dairy maid was observed to suffer from illness, which, however, she constantly spoke of as nothing, but knowing dames saw too clearly the truth. One morning there was found in a field a newly born babe strangled. The unfortunate girl was at once suspected as being the parent, and the evidence was soon sufficient to charge her with the murder. She was tried, and, chiefly by the evidence of the young farmer and his family, convicted of and executed for the murder. Everything now went wrong in the farm, and the young man suddenly left it and went into another part of the country. Still nothing prospered, and gradually he took to drink to drown some secret sorrow. He was more frequently on the road by night than by day, and go where he would, a white hare was constantly crossing his path. The white hare was often seen by others, almost always under the feet of his horse, and the poor terrified animal would go like the wind to avoid the strange apparition. One morning the young farmer was found drowned in a forsaken mine, and the horse, which had evidently suffered extreme terror, was grazing near the corpse. Beyond all doubt, the white hare, which is known to hunt the perjured and the false-hearted to death, had terrified the horse to such a degree that eventually the rider was thrown into the mine waste in which the body was found. End quote. Here again we have a story involving a young woman who has been wronged, and a pretty tragic one. She's abandoned, and in this case there seems to have been an illegitimate child, and then an execution for infanticide. Then the spirit of this wronged woman returning to torment the young farmer, and ultimately causing his downfall and his death. And this particular story and variants of it is one that crops up in a few different sources. There's no reference to particular names or places, or even a specific time period. It almost seems to be a folk tale or a tradition that's maybe an amalgamation of various local stories and serves to kind of demonstrate that overarching story pattern that you tend to find. It's interesting that quite often the man in these stories is out riding when the hare crosses their path, or they're out hunting. And this link between the hunter and the hare is a theme that often crops up as well. Tony Dean and Tony Shaw in their book Folklore of Cornwall mention a separate ghost story from over near Wadebridge. They write, and I quote, Another white hare haunts the churchyard at Eglisale, together with the headless ghost of the hunter, who, doubting its supernatural existence, tried to shoot it. Now, this is an interesting one because... It suggests that the hunter has wronged the hare by attempting to shoot it, and then when he dies, he's doomed to haunt the churchyard as well. Though, how and when he managed to lose his head is not explained in this instance. I want to take a look now at probably the most famous story and example from Cornwall, that again incorporates a lot of these elements within it. 
I've drawn together a few of the different versions in this retelling, and it's commonly known as the White Hair of Lou. Once there was a young woman who worked at the harbour hawking her wares, selling the catch of the day. She took a fancy to a local lad, and for a time they were happy together, and she assumed that one day they might marry. But it was not to be, for the young man's attention had been caught by a pretty barmaid who worked at the Jolly Sailor. Before long, the two of them ran away together and were married, leaving the poor young woman heartbroken. All the pain, the anguish and the humiliation was too much for her to bear, and eventually she died of a broken heart. The young man and his new bride soon moved in together in West Loo. It was a tumble-down place near the harbour, and just a stone's throw from the inn. But the young woman's spirit could not rest. All of that pain and anguish lingered on after her death, and seeking revenge, she soon began appearing to him in the form of a white hair. Each night, her ghost bounded down Talent Hill and followed him into the Jolly Sailor, driving the young man to despair. One night, as her ghost began her nightly journey, she spotted a great storm brewing out at sea, and knowing she had family and friends that would soon be heading to their boats, she realised that she must warn them. From that night onwards, Whenever a storm began brewing at sea, she would scamper down to the harbour, running between the ropes tied between the boats, darting frantically to and fro as a warning to all. The townsfolk came to take her appearance as a portentous one, and as a result, the lives of many a sailor and fisherman were saved. As for her former lover, each night he was haunted by the presence of the white hare, who followed him wherever he went until one day he became ill and died. The young woman at last had her revenge. On stormy nights, it's said you can still see the spirit of the white hair flitting about between the boats as a warning to the people of Lou. So there's some familiar themes in this story, along with some little variations. We've got, again, a young woman who is spurned, and who dies of a broken heart, and whose spirit returns in the form of the white hair, again as a kind of revenge against her former lover. But unlike those previous stories, the young man isn't out riding or out hunting, he's just walking around Lou, or on the way to the inn when the hare appears. And what's interesting is that we get very specific locations. Talent Hill in West Loo, and The Jolly Sailor, a pub which is still there, and in fact has the animated version of this story, created by May's Tales, on their website, so I recommend you give that a look as well. I should perhaps say that some writers have linked this story of the White Hair of Loo and its associations with The Jolly Sailor, and that it may have been caught up with the local smuggling operation that perhaps centred around that pub. That leads into the whole smuggling ghost cover story thing, which we've kind of discussed in the past, so I'm not going to delve into that here. Something in this story that strikes me as a little different is that alongside this familiar pattern of a haunting targeted at a specific individual, we also have the appearance of the hare as an omen a forewarning of disaster, and actually appearing in a way that protects the community by letting the fishermen know there's going to be a storm. In their book, Dean and Shaw write, Before the introduction of auxiliary engines, Lou fishermen stayed ashore if the hare was seen, rather than tempt fate by putting to sea. The implication there being that the appearance of the hare was genuinely taken as some kind of portent to be taken seriously. And I find this dual purpose of the ghost, both as a helpful warning to sailors and at the same time a vengeful spirit, fascinating. It's becoming clear that these hair stories and superstitions 
while there are definitely recurring themes and patterns in there, there's something more complex going on in terms of the powers that these creatures are deemed to have and how their appearance should be interpreted. And so to try and help me make sense of what's going on in the world of, for want of a better term, hair folklore, I've enlisted the help of Mike O'Connor, an author, musician and storyteller who's got a broad knowledge of folklore and storytelling traditions and has even incorporated them within his books, such as Cornish Folk Tales. So a little while back we sat down to have a Zoom chat, initially talking about the hare as an animal and as it appears in folklore in general. Hares have a unique place in folklore uh, and folk tales and superstition, I think, um, especially in the British Isles. Um, now, the animal itself, mountain hares, white hares, are indigenous to Britain, uh, unlike the brown hare and the rabbit. Uh, what happened was that the white hare retreated to upland areas after the brown hare was introduced um, because, of course, the, the, it was thought that the brown hare was brought across either by the Romans or maybe a bit earlier than that, you know. And then uh, the rabbits, of course, were introduced by the Normans. Uh, they were farmed by, by the Normans. So what seems to have happened is that rabbit tails and hare tails, some of which overlap, have been evolving through this process uh of sort of changing ecology changing the changing of the of the hair population and hair stories i'm sure have been around for a phenomenal length of time hair tales of course are usually anthropomorphic the hair represents or possesses human characteristics in some way or another anthropomorphic tales which includes hair stories, can be 6,000 years old. And they've been there in language for a long time. There's, for example, in medieval writing, there are poems that mention the hair. The phrase, as mad as a March hare, is medieval in its origin. Um, I, I don't know precisely where, but about 1500 or thereabouts, you'll find uh, poems that refer reference hares and their uh, characteristic and unusual behaviour. The other thing we ought to note, so we've, so we've got antiquity, we've got unique behaviour, and the other thing is the colour white. White is significant. White often implies in folk tales and language it implies purity or holiness uh, the fine lady who rides a white horse to banbury cross or lady godiva riding a white horse those horses are the symbol of the lady's virtue in folklore additionally it implies magic so how many times do we read of a for example of a white stag for example pursued by King Arthur in uh, Geraint ac Enid uh, in the Mabinogion, or by King Gradlon in the legend of Is, a Breton tale, you know? So either the creature there has supernatural properties of its own, or it leads humans into a, some sort of a mystical other world. And unicorns are white for just the same reasons, okay? So that is the sort of context in which hares have, have grown up in our our folklore and i i'm aware i think of of about six different sort of i would say generic types of hare stories and i'm I, i'm going to include rabbit stories in those as well because uh, uh there is a crossover and uh and, and uh i suspect that we can we can group them together and the first and the oldest scenario probably is the scenario of the hare and the tortoise in aesop's fables okay the hare is always swift but overconfident and perhaps rather unwise and of course he mocks the uh tortoise for its uh 
slowness and laughs when the tortoise uh, challenges him to a race. In the race, of course, the hare gets so far ahead that he stops, has a rest, falls asleep, and so the tortoise rushes across, well, rushes slowly across the finishing line and wins the race. And this was written down in about 500 BC, and the tale appears in the uh, Panchatantra in India by 500 AD, and it, 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 it goes everywhere. And in fact, it's it's, it has a close relation, uh, which I don't think is in Aesop, but it's a very well-known story that you'll find in Grimm and many other places. And that's the, the tale of the hare and the hedgehog. Uh, sometimes it's a hare and a turtle or a hare and a something else, but essentially the same thing. The poor old hedgehog is sitting outside his house one day and the hare comes past and mocks him for being generally not up to much. And the... Um, the hedgehog challenges the hare to a race. And the hare says, well, OK, but it seems very obvious I'm going to win. Uh, the hare, as usual, is uh, looks down upon the uh, the hedgehog and he goes up to the start line. It's a ploughed field and they agree they will run uh, the length of the ploughed field. Someone shouts, go, and the hare and the hedgehog disappear into their furrows and start running. About two seconds after the race has started, all of a sudden, there's a cry, I've finished! And Hare looks up, and there, in the other end of the furrow, is the hedgehog. Of course, what he's done is he's told Mrs Hedgehog to go and hide there. And Mrs Hedgehog, who looks just like Mr Hedgehog, as far as the hare is concerned. Anyway, this process is repeated up and down the furrow until the hare is exhausted, and he gives up. So the hare is indeed swift, but perhaps he's a, and a little condescending, but he is also gullible. So that's my that's my first group of of hair stories. Okay, so um, the second one that um, we find in Cornwall in several examples is the shape changing situation. Uh, for example, the hunt is out and uh, it catches or nearly catches a white hare. Uh, that disappears somewhere close to or perhaps through the door of uh, an old woman's cottage, having sustained some uh, minor injury. And, of course, they go into the cottage and there is nothing but an old lady, but she is nursing a very similar injury herself. So the implication is that she in some way is a shapeshifter. She's a witch or something like that. The hare is very often one of a shape-changing sequence. So as in the pursuit of uh, Guion Bach uh, by Keridwen in the tale of the birth of uh, Taliesin, and uh, you have a sequence of animals that change one to the other. And uh, so uh, young Guion Bach uh, turns himself into a hare so that he can run away from Keridwen. She turns herself into a hound to follow him. She very nearly catches him, but then he turns in, he jumps into the river, turns into a salmon, you know, and uh, she, of course, turns into an otter, and the chase continues. Um, so that's, that, that's the, the sort of second um, shape-changing situation that, that you encounter. And there is one rather nasty one. There's a, a tale from Norfolk called The Hanging Game, in which uh, a group of feckless youths decide to hang each other uh, just to see how long they can hang before they die, um, which is a you know particularly uh, stupid thing to do. Anyway, they're in the middle of that, and when all of a sudden an injured hare comes past, and the lads who are not in that moment suspended thinks ah an easy supper we will go and chase it and of course his hair leads them across the countryside leaving the poor chap suspended by his neck of course he dies and so the devil who is in fact the hair uh, gains another soul in hell because suicide uh, uh, dooms you to hell uh, if you believe that sort of a thing so um so those are the sort of shape changing examples we have um they are to do with magic. Uh, there's occasionally to do with the devil, and they're certainly to do with uh, old ladies in cottages. You mentioned uh, Pengersik, 
Um, the white hair, my third category I identified was the um, the hair as a harbinger of doom. There are several Cornish tales, well, quite a lot like that, actually. There's Pengersik, there's the white hair of Lou, and there's the white rabbit of Eglisale. And usually the hair is associated with um, or acting as uh, on behalf of uh, some wronged individual, usually a murdered woman who has probably had a child by some irresponsible chap. And of course, the hare comes back to seek revenge on the adversary, haunting them in some way, either driving them to insanity or frightening their horse so it jumps off a cliff or runs into the sea. Um, there are two versions of Pen Gersick. You can have either the cliff or the sea or both, uh, depending on how you want to finish him off. But we, what you get is the white hair to uh, do that on behalf of the lady that he wronged. So a great overview there, I think, of the hare and its place in folklore and mythology. We then moved on to talk a little bit about the role of the hare, if you like, what, what it can signify or represent. There are some famous images and representations of the hare, or possibly rabbits, in artwork. Perhaps most notably, and this occurs in other parts of the world as well, but also here in the southwest. There's an image of what appear to be three hares, or possibly rabbits, which are linked by their ears in a sort of circular motif. It's often known as Tinner's rabbits, and this is something that Mike discussed as well. I, I think I'd like to invite you to look at a couple of uh, other, or consider, or think of a couple of other uh, areas. And the mm. first is the... Um, special status of the hare. So this is Mike's category number five, if you like. We've already mentioned that white is a symbol of innocence or purity. The hare, in a number of tales, has a special status uh, of worthiness to be protected, possibly because of its innocence. And, uh, and this worthiness to be protected may be related to its status as a, a mystical creature, or it could be a symbol of past culture and national identity. I mentioned earlier that the old native species of Britain is the white hare. And with successive invasions of Romans, uh, Saxons and Normans, uh, brown hares and rabbits were, were introduced. And the white hare progressively retreated to the mountains and moors, which is where the old Celtic languages are preserved. And I suspect that either consciously or subconsciously, the white hare possibly symbolises past times and past cultures. And you can see that the white hare becoming progressively rarer in lowland areas Seeing one would be an unusual, a portent of something uh, significant, spiritual or, or otherwise. And uh, an, an example of uh, a story like that is the, the Welsh tale of uh, Melangeth, who finds a hare. Uh, it's being pursued by the hounds. She swoops up this hare, picks it up, clutches it to her bosom and protects it. And so here we have the Welsh princess protecting the old Welsh culture, if you like, protecting this symbol of the way things were. And, of course, in the story, what happens is that the young prince who is hunting this poor unfortunate animal is so impressed that he gives her land and she can she can build, have a nunnery or whatever she wants to have on it, and uh, people presumably live happily ever after. The other thing that always provokes questions, and rightly so, are Tinner's rabbits, if you haven't come across Tinner's rabbits, um, very often, uh, in, I think there are probably all, a couple of dozen examples of Tinner's rabbits. They are three hares, not rabbits. They're called Tinner's rabbits, but they're hares. They're three hares uh, carved into a roof boss, um, and they're running around 
if the roof boss, if you like, and they share ears. This is very difficult to explain on the radio. It's wonderful. It's easy to see when you look at it. Um, mostly they're in Devon. There are about 16 churches in Devon. Um, there are some in Dorset and Somerset, and there's a, a few in Cornwall. The one I know about particularly is at Cotille House in the chapel at Cotille, so Tamer Valley. And the, um, I mean, the myth that goes with it is that they symbolise something to do with the uh, mining on Dartmoor, and, and the church, the Devon churches are mostly on and around Dartmoor and Tamer Valley, that sort of area. But no one's actually ever been able to explain to me why three hairs should be particularly associated with miners. Um, and it doesn't explain why there aren't more in Cornwall, because, uh, as you know, the uh, medieval uh, mining on Dartmoor was, I think, really a, a sister occupation to the mining in Cornwall. Um, they were mining, there was hard rock mining for similar minerals. Uh, many Cornishmen went and worked in Devon mines. That's why you have uh, wrestling in Devon. That's why you have uh, step dancing in Devon. That, that's all similar-ish to what goes on in Cornwall. It's, it's shared culture that, uh, of course, subsequently evolved in parallel. People have told me that um, the three hairs represent the, the Holy Trinity in Christian religion. Um, I can't quite see why it would. Uh, people basically have gone around looking for things that come in threes and say, ah, yes, it must be that. Um, the purity of the hair has led to people associate the hair as a symbol with the Virgin Mary, as it would appear that some people at some stage thought that hairs were capable of a virgin birth. I haven't been able to track that back, so I can't I can't really follow that one up. Another good one I've heard is that the hairs represent the temptations of the flesh, the world and the devil. Well, I'm all in favour of that sort of thing. But um, <laughs> uh, but basically, nobody really knows, I think, where these tinners rabbits come from or what they stand for. It could just be you had one chap that particularly liked carving hairs. I don't know. I think these are all fairly modern hypotheses, post-Victorian anyway, uh, and I don't know of historical evidence that supports them. It may be there, uh, and, and I just don't know about it, of course. That's eminently possible, but um, I don't know the answer to that one. I wanted to know more about the way that hares were regarded by people, because there are all these stories and all these associations, these representations, was it perhaps highly revered, highly respected, because there were all these mystical properties associated with it as an animal? We have an analogue these days in as much as there are still people who will say, I saw a black cat cross the road. And sometimes it's for good luck and sometimes it's for bad luck. I don't know. But uh, for some reason, people still... Uh, see a black cat crossing the road as a portent and uh, the black cat in some way is held to be um, to have some sort of mystical power well I have no doubt that that's exactly what people thought about white hairs and that goes right the way back to well certainly to medieval times so when um, when the Mabinogion is being put together and written down for the first time in about the 12th century. Uh, then we've got, is it uh, Eric and Enid? I'd have to look it up. Uh, but you finish up with King Arthur uh, pursuing uh, pursuing a white uh, stag uh, that mysteriously appears. And this is a, a great portent, and it, uh, carrying catching a white stag is really a, a very significant thing. So... In folk tales, at least in the 12th century, this white creature is symbolic. It is powerful, and the uh, I think that white hairs are just the same. Uh, I don't think there's any any difference there at all. The white hair is otherworldly, uh, and um, it is a creature that 
can inhabit both this world and the next, if you like. It it, it shares this characteristic with piskies, leprechauns, that sort of uh, that sort of creature, and and possibly unicorns as well. I want to come back now to the tale of Pengersik because there's an interesting addition to the tale in Mike's retelling in his book. So in this story, Pengersik's former lover, a princess from lands in the east, has returned along with his newborn child. And Pengersik decides to get rid of them by pushing the princess off a cliff while she's holding the baby. Soon afterwards, the body of the mother is found by the crew of a passing ship. But miraculously, the baby has survived. The next bit of the story reads as follows. That night, in a dream, a white hare appeared to the captain of the ship. The hare explained that the child's mother was a princess from the captain's own country, and the child's father was the treacherous Pengersik so the kindly sea captain decided to raise the child as his own. He brought the lad up well, but he never told him who his true parents were. I was fascinated by this little bit in the story because we have the white hair cropping up again and this time appearing to the sea captain in dreams. So I wanted to discuss the Pengersik story a little bit more. What's going on there? as well as this other mystical ability that the hare seems to possess. I think that leads me on to something that I was going to ask you, which is in your retelling of, of Pengersik, there's also this moment where the the, the princess has been um, thrown off the cliff and then uh, is found with the babe still alive in her arms by this, uh, by this ship and the captain, and then the captain has this dream and the hare appears in this dream. And that was something I kind of wanted to ask you about is how almost where you see that falling in terms of the theme and and the fact that the hair is able to appear in dreams. I think that that's a a really good uh, point to bring up. The in that particular tale, it is convenient for the storyteller to have the uh, captain of the ship find the lifeless body and dream that dream. Um, It helps the later evolution of the story. But um, I think that when you look at the other mentions of hares in Bottrell, there's huge imagination about what the hares uh, do, where they're found and where they, what they get up to. And, um, I think that that tells us of at least an understanding of the mystical nature of the white hair and the fact that uh, w- whether or not anybody really did dream about it, it doesn't matter in the slightest. Um, the fact is that um, whoever gave that story to Bottrell, then that uh, he was quite happy to record that exactly the way that it was. Now, Pengersik is interesting because it's a story that, in its genesis, it goes back to the time of the Crusades. So we're talking about a um, a story that's maybe sort of 12th, 13th century, something like that. So this is not like a, a Cornish fireside tale. It, it turns into something more like a Cornish fireside tale when he gets back from the Crusades and he's living in Pengersic Castle and uh, doing all sorts of magical things and generally being um, uh, generally being miserable. And, and I don't know, and I don't suppose we'll ever will know, at what stage the hare appeared in the story. It may well be that uh, we've got two tales here grafted together, one uh, that is uh, medieval and one that is actually uh, sort of early modern. But, I mean, it makes a great story the way that it is anyway. But um, the uh, 
the fact that the hair is there and representing the ghost, if you like, of this wronged woman and her her child, um, that is uh, that's completely in keeping with what we see in lots of other tales. We then moved on to talk about some of the parallels with this story and something like the white hair of Lou and this theme of the wronged woman. The fact that there is a very similar story in the uh, white hair of Lou uh, where a sailor marries a young lady and then goes off and uh, pursues an, a, a, another uh, spouse and uh, she eventually uh, dies of love and comes back and uh, haunts her her, fur, her her husband in, in in the shape of a white hair that's it's a parallel theme isn't it and um i think that um, all you it's like the story of pengersic but without the uh without the overseas travel bit added on at the beginning so i, I think we can hypothesize that the belief in the hair representing a wronged woman was quite widespread because uh, Lou, after all, is quite a long way from West Cornwall, where Pengersic is. I mean, uh, Pengersic is down on the uh, right in, in the west. It's uh, not too far to the uh, east of Penzance, and um, it's a very long way from Lou. Yes, I know. I, I always tell people that... Uh, stories are the most portable of culture that's absolutely true i think that uh i think that the the white hair of lou story which is so like the uh the end part of uh, the pengersic story uh, just tells us that that end part is part of a, a a very widely known tale that uh certainly it occurs in places other than cornwall the, the, the uniquely Cornish element of it is, in fact, that uh, Pengersic gets craft, uh, grafted onto the beginning of the story and um, and it turns itself into a, in, into a tale about uh, someone who wishes to have magic, magical powers at their command, and eventually both uh, his lust for power and lust for the command of magic uh, destroys him. Something that strikes me a lot about these stories, whether it's Wild Harris or Pengersic or the White Hair of Lou, is that it's about a wrongdoer being punished, essentially. We touched on this a little bit in the Mermaids episode, and the episode on Piskies, in fact. I have to wonder how much these, as well as the many stories in folklore in general, are kind of morality tales. Do you think we should see some of these as almost like there's a morality within it? Because I'm assuming then that the, like, say, taking the white hair of, of Lou, that maybe she represents, talking about sort of purity and things like that, either what's right or the person that's been wronged and that kind of thing, that it's a, there's a lesson to be learned from it in a way? Uh, yes. Um, folk tales survive because they entertain and also because they have some function. And um, folk tales do educate. Folk tales evolve because society evolves and what we want to teach people uh, changes over the generations. Uh, there are stories that I will not tell because I now consider them to be immoral and uh, teach people altogether the wrong uh, the wrong thing, the wrong way to behave. Some of these stories are very, you can easily imagine, they are anti-Semitic or horribly racist or misogynistic, is that a word? Uh, and they're tales that I will not tell. Or at least I would only tell in circumstances that I can control. And for example, for example, that I mean, I won't tell the tale of Loki, which has no redemption in it at all. Uh, it, if you tell the whole darn thing, it finishes up with the end of the world, which is uh, <laughs> a, a bit of a downer, really. But I won't tell that unless I have an audience in front of me that I can then tell another story that talks about 
the recreation of the world after Ragnarok. So, uh, but by and large, if I consider a story to be immoral, I will not tell it. And that's not because I'm a Christian, uh, which I am, uh, but it's it's because I think that as a human being, we all, all human beings together should be uh, seeking uh, a morality that uh, that we jointly espouse that is tolerant and uh, loving and uh, creative and not all the opposites of those things so yes the stories that we've got they are they do have a moral side to them uh, the fact that the lady comes or the, the white hair comes back and haunts the sailor from Lou or uh, Pengersik or whoever it is that's uh entirely in keeping with the morality of the times of the story. In fact, it's pretty much in t keeping with the morality of today. You know, I think that uh, if you treat somebody badly, one instinctively, perhaps not very Christianly, but instinctively says, oh, we, he, he or she or whoever it is deserves to be punished. Um, they deserve to be punished. I also think they should be re-educated, but that's a, not always an easy thing to do. Um, so, yes, the stories do have a moral nature they have an education all stories have an educational side to them um uh, in fact my book of wisdom tales expounds that uh, at some length I, this is not meant to be a plug but um uh, it's uh, <laughs> uh, i think that's something about our own folk tales a, a side that's uh, received uh, or has received inadequate uh, attention which is why i i wrote that book and uh these uh, our folk tales very often are, are just teaching us lessons from life and uh the hair stories are just part of that sort of panoply of lessons mm -hmm. you've got to remember that um even ragged schools for the poor didn't become prevalent until after 1815 the ragged school in truro wasn't built until about 1830 i think so Unless you happened to have a lord of the manor or a landlord who was particularly uh, benevolent, uh, the only school you had was the the field, the fireside and the dusty road, as I have said before. Something I suppose we should talk about a bit more is the idea of hares in local legends and their ability to transform Mike talked about it in his overview earlier, and we've touched on it a bit in some of the stories like Pengersik, where the spirit of the princess appears in either the form of a white hare or in human form. If you ever listened to the episode on the Biddeford Witches, where I chatted to Professor Marion Gibson, we discussed this concept of animal familiars connected with witchcraft, and also the belief that witches were said to be able to transform or shapeshift as well. There's also a very famous story from West Cornwall, passed down to us by William Bottrell, which is called Duffy and the Devil. In one part of the story, a character named Squire Lovell, or Lavell, relays to his young wife that he's been out hunting. He's been searching for ages when suddenly a hare appears and they give chase. And I quote, And now I believe that what we took for a hare was a witch that we chased into this haunted wood. Looking through the thickets, I spied on a bare spot, surrounded by old withered oaks, a glimmering flame rising through the clouds of smoke. The dogs skulked back and stood around me like things scared. Getting nearer now, and looking through an opening, I saw scores of women. Many came through the thicket, like hares, made a spring through the flame, and came out as decent lasses as one might see in Burian Church of a holiday. So the implication being that these hares have jumped through the flames and then been transformed into these young women. So it's clear that hares were linked with superstitions around witchcraft, sorcery and transformation. And this seems to have taken different forms as well. Alex Langstone writes in From Granite to Sea, and I quote, 
A pewter hair charm was found above a window in a cob wall at Trebrown Farm near Liscard during Easter 1988. Animals are often found concealed above or below doors, around windows and inside the fireplaces of old houses to protect the occupants from unwanted negative influences. And hares are considered particularly lucky. End quote. The hare then acting as, I suppose, what you'd call a protective charm, a household guardian in a way. And we get examples of this in houses from all over during the early modern period, where you get items such as witch bottles or shoes or mummified cats, things like that, which are concealed as a protection against witchcraft, basically. And this ties in with a case mentioned in The Leaping Hare, where the authors write, and I quote, The remains of a cat have frequently been discovered in the footings of buildings, and also, but less often, of the hare. Here, however, is one outstanding and strangely recent example of a hare sacrifice. It comes from Cornwall, about 1890. An addition was being made to a cottage near Falmouth. One day the work stopped. Upon inquiry, the builders revealed that a sacrifice would have to be made to the outside gods of a virgin hare trapped by a virgin boy. Seeing that the building would never get finished otherwise, the sacrifice was agreed to, provided that no cruelty was involved. Some years afterwards, during repairs to the roof, the remains of a rabbit were found in a beautifully made coffin near the top of the wall. End quote. The authors go on to speculate that, presumably, they couldn't find a hare, so a rabbit was deemed a fitting substitute. What that seems to imply, and that fits in with something that we've already talked about, is this idea that the hare was seen to possess mystical properties, but that they could obviously provide protection of some kind as well. I think that leads us on nicely to an aspect that intrigues me about the White Hare of Lou story, where the ghostly hare is also acting to protect the town by serving as a warning to sailors. So I asked Mike about this idea of hares serving as a form of protection, but also acting as a kind of omen of disaster too. Um, there's, there's something I, I kind of wanted to, to bring up, which is almost, it sort of, it creeps into the sort of tail end of the the, um, the white hair of Lou, actually, in terms of the hair in a, in a sort of protective way, um, because there seems to almost be this relationship with the community at the end with this white hair who almost comes to indicate when there's likely to be a storm. Almost, you could argue, like, in a protective way for the community is a, like a warning. But I, I wonder how much um, there's a crossover with the idea of people wearing things like a hare's foot and in a protective sense. So I wanted to get your thoughts on this this idea of hares being a sort of protective or, or, or charm in a way. Um, yes, I haven't seen a hare's foot charm for a long time. And I think that 50 years ago... Uh, you would quite often find slightly alternative people with uh, a hare's foot charm. It seems to have gone out of fashion these days, but that's probably because we're more vegetarian uh, than we were uh, a bit back. And uh, people no longer rejoice at the mention of jugged hare or something like that. In fact, the idea of going out and catching a poor hare so it seems a, 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 pr a pretty antisocial thing to do to me. There are tales in which vindictive mermaids engineer a situation whereby subsequently, if you hear them singing, uh, it tells you there's a storm on the way. And the fishermen always say, aha, in that case, we'll stay in, in the harbour today rather than go out fishing because they've, they've heard the, the song of the mermaid. If you think about the story of the white rabbit of Eglisail, and that this white rabbit basically haunts uh, Eglisail uh, churchyard. 
and nobody quite knows why. The story doesn't tell us why. Um, however, to see it is uh, a, a bad omen, and to chase it or to kill it uh, can be uh, very bad news. And when someone says, this is a very silly uh, tradition, I'm going to go out and catch it, of course, what happens is his body is found the next morning with a gunshot wound, and um, it would appear that he's either shot himself or the white rabbit has taken the gun and finished him off. Um, but the significant part here is that this is a tale that is owned by the community. This isn't a tale that was just told by one particular droll teller or a, a local storyteller or uh, a local in the pub. This is a story that is owned by the community and it's widely known. It's widely known to this day. You can speak to people who live in Wade Bridge and uh, uh, Trawarder and all around there and they will tell you, oh yes, we know about the White Rabbit of Eglisale. So in the same way as the white hair of Lou came to be, if you like, uh, appreciated by the community, um, then the same thing happens here in, in, in Eglisale. There is another way you could look at it, of course, and that is that the acceptance of the white hair by the community is a vindication of the uh, the white hair's actions and the morality that's implicit by that. So that the uh, the fact that the chap who um, uh, deceived his young wife and went off with another woman uh, subsequently comes to a sticky end, um, the fact that the white hair then gets the, the mark of approval from the community, that is the stamp of approval upon the, that course of action as well. I cannot tell you if the uh, the Lou story is is widely known in Lou. It's uh, a, a little bit off my normal beaten track. But, uh, uh, but it just so happens I am there on Saturday storytelling, so I shall, I shall make some inquiries. <laughs> <laughs> We've looked at a few different stories from across Cornwall involving the hare in some way, often following a similar pattern or incorporating very similar themes. For instance, the idea of a woman who has been wronged, their return in spirit form to haunt the wrongdoer. Maybe caught up within this is the concept Mike spoke about of the colour white being significant, representing purity and virtue. Then we've got magic and transformation playing a part in these stories, sometimes because, like Duffy and the Devil, it's a link to sorcery and witchcraft. And then there's the transformation as part of the story because that morphing into either a human or animal form is a way of communicating with the living, to convey a message or to see that justice is done. Then we have the hare as a portent, warning a community about a potential disaster or serving as a protective charm for a household. Clearly, this animal was significant to people in the past, and there was a lot of superstition attached to it. Exactly why? Whether there is something in the nature of the animal itself, its elusiveness and its behaviour in the wild, is something that I think is, is open for debate. But ultimately, for me anyway, as ever, it's the stories themselves that continue to fascinate me and are an important part of local folklore that deserves to be kept alive and to be celebrated. I also think that the, the history geek in me often sees these tales as a way of, I suppose, trying to tap into an earlier mindset, a link with the local superstitions, traditions and customs. And something that I wanted to discuss with Mike was whether any of these superstitions surrounding the hare are still with us in some form in the present day. But I have to wonder whether you think there are people who still look, are superstitious about hares in, in the modern day. Uh, I think there are, absolutely. And um, uh, hares are not as common as, as rabbits. I mean, 
every day I see rabbits out in the field um, as I walk down the lane, and uh, that's absolutely fine. However, hares are much rarer, and uh, of course, down here in Cornwall, uh, we do not have white hares anymore. Uh, white hares only exist really uh, north of Hadrian's Wall uh, and in Derbyshire. Um, I'm I like to tell people uh, when they're looking gullible that the reason that Hadrian's Wall was built, in fact, was to keep the white hairs uh, in Scotland, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, which is, of course, a complete piffle. But um, that's where you find white hairs. But the fact that any hair is as individual and mysterious in its behaviour, when you see them boxing each other, which I've only ever seen on uh, video, I haven't seen it in real life, um, then uh, I think that uh, the reason that people say as, as mad as a March hare is because the behaviour of these animals is is unpredictable. Um, and in, uh, in the mating season in March, they will jump in the air for no apparent reason. They will suddenly change direction when running for no apparent reason which is why it appears that they have their own agency. They mm. have their own agenda that we don't understand. And and I'm really pleased that we don't understand it for two reasons. One, I think that they should be, they should be allowed to get on with doing things the way they want it. <laughs> and two, I think that it's really good for us to exercise our imagination and try and say, what does that mean to us? How do we, um, how do we interpret that? I've now found the reference, actually, a poem dating from the year 1500 called Blowball's Test. And it, the one li the critical line goes, Then they begin to swave and to stare and be as brindless as a march a hare. Uh, they begin to swerve and stare and be as brainless as a march hare. So... Um, uh, I think that that's uh, that tells us that in Tudor times, at least, people were thinking the same thoughts and observing the same things. And of course, uh, yeah, Lewis Carroll, the March Hare, appears in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I can't remember. I can't quite remember what the March Hare was doing there. Wasn't he something to do with the? It was he the keeper of time or something like that. I can't um, remember because it, it, I, I mix up the roles between the March Hare and the Mad Hatter because they're in the same in the same yes. sort of same context. So I can't remember. <laughs> it's also anarchic, but uh, well, yeah, absolutely so. And um, but in the fact that the hare is, if you like, an anarchic character, that is an analog of its apparent behaviour in the wild, at least apparent to to humans, anyway. I think the thing is that the hare is, as I say, it has its own agency, it has its own agenda, because it's scarce and rare. When it appears, it's important. It travels quickly. It, it very often cannot be caught. And it's it, it has a whole raft of, of magical properties. Um, of, and human beings have been in awe of these for a very long time. And uh, whether we look at the hair as a symbol of the past or just as a, a wonderful piece of sort of natural history to, to look at, um, either way, uh, hairs are absolutely fascinating and their stories are too. That's it for this episode of The Pisky Trap. I'd like to thank the wonderful Mike O'Connor for taking the time to chat about all things hair related. I'd also like to thank Anna Chalton and May's Tales for their help with the research into the white hair of Lou. And I highly recommend checking out their animated version of the tale, which I'll pop a link to in the show notes. And if this has sparked your interest in the topic, you can check out the different sources used in this episode in the reading list for this series. If you enjoyed this episode and you've been enjoying the series, then please give us a like and subscribe. You can find The Pisky Trap on Twitter and Instagram. And if you'd like to help support the series further and keep this project going, then please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash 
The Pisky Trap. The Pisky Trap is presented by me, Keith Wallace, with music by Elizabeth Westcott and original artwork by Karis Harrington. We'll be back again very soon. Thanks for listening. <laughs>